Hello and welcome to episode seven of Shared Discovery, the show and podcast dedicated to sharing all the exciting and enjoyable aspects of games and gaming. I'm your host, Victor, and today I'm once again joined by my returning guest, Xander, co-host. How you doing? How have uh, you been? Pretty tired. Tired? Pretty what, tired? Why are you tired? What have you been playing? Uh, Breath of the Wild. <laughs> Yeah? A ton of it. A ton of it. We're trying to do what? Completing all the shrines. Yeah, that's a monumental task that you're trying yeah. to do, trying to do in preparation of what's the new one called? Tears of the Kingdom. Ah, uh, yeah. So you're trying to be ready for that. That yeah. comes out this might date the episode, but that comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's cool. That's that's been keeping you awake at night. I'm still personally I'm still on my hunt uh, to complete all of the dex entries in Pokemon Legends Arceus before I start the game. Yeah, and you found that. that oh, yeah, yeah, this is awesome. I found a cheese, right? So there's, in the start of the game, you can't get across the water and, until you, you know, progress a little bit. But there's one Pokemon called Bee Barrel that's water type. You can throw it in the water, you can get six of them, and you can make a bridge. It's called Bee Barrel Bridge. You walk across it, and it opens the world for you. You turn into Jesus. Yeah, it's great. So I haven't tried it yet. I tried one, and I stood on it, so I think it might work. So that's been keeping me busy. I've been having a lot of fun with that. You, you inspired me with your Pokemon episode mm -hmm. idea. So uh, mm -hmm. a lot of fun with that. So what are we talking about today? Uh, today we are talking about open world games. Yeah, absolutely. You and I, we were talking about this. We wanted to talk about genres, styles of game, play styles, and where where to start, right? Open world games. We've been, we've had so much fun with those throughout our lives. Breath of the Wild's your favorite game. Yeah. So we thought this was a natural start. Yeah, and it was also my first one. Yeah, your very first open world game. <laughs> What's... What's, what, why is it your favorite? What keeps you playing it? Because of how vast it is, uh, mm. there's also the music. Yeah. Music that keeps me wanting to listen to it. I know, you always show up and you're like, here, listen to this song. This plays in one little room in, the, yeah. <laughs> in this village. This is the only place this song plays and it's yeah. great. <laughs> That's awesome. My first open world game was actually Legend of Zelda. The very first one from 1986. I played the remake for the Game Boy. Yeah. yeah. So I played it when I was seven. So I had no idea what I was doing. But I knew any of us. Right. And I didn't realize how influential it is. Until doing this research, oh, I didn't yeah. realize how influential the original Legend of Zelda is to the open world genre. So I would say it's not my favorite anymore. That, I've struggled to figure out what that is. However, as we did the research, like, what it, where do I land? Yeah, it's hard. Uh, you know, Skyrim's great. Skyrim's always been great. It's always great, especially with the modding community out there. Yeah. Um, I'd say probably my most played one is World of Warcraft. So maybe that is my favorite because of playtime. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you also have the yes, I have the wow. board game, and then this. Right here, this is the actual original handbook oh. from 2005 when, oh. when the very first, when World of Warcraft initially released. Oh, I bought the collector's edition and have that book still. So yeah, and it's still played today. Yeah, and so you can you can crack that is open. Is it still getting updates? Oh yeah, they're still getting expansions. <laughs> yeah, and people actually go back and play the base form of the game because vanilla WoW is what they call it, right? It's, or classic. People still play that today. So open world games are great. We're talking yeah. a lot about them. But let's talk. Let's dive in and to get into some of the history a little bit, right? Because mm -hmm. with this with this series, we want to kind of zoom in specifically on one style of game. We want to get a deep look at where they where it was, where is it now, what makes it unique, what makes it fun, what makes it engaging. And so we're gonna go through that history and then we're gonna provide some like the core mechanics for the genre and then look at some pros and cons and give you some of our recommendations. We've talked about a few games and we'll probably recommend them, but we have some I mean, other ones as well. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have some we have a list. other ones. I'm excited to get to that, right? So history, let's, let's go back in time. Yeah. Do, do you know what the first, considered the first open world game? Uh, uh, sure. Sure, okay. <laughs> Let me tell you. It goes, I was surprised by this, right? 
the game, the Chinese-Japanese board game Go, all the way back from 300 BCE, is actually considered by many to be the first. It's like over 2,000 years ago. Over 2,000 years ago, <laughs> variation of an open world game. And I, I've heard Go, but I don't know, didn't know what it was, so I did a little research, and essentially, you're on a grid, one person has white little pieces, the other one has black little pieces. You're trying to claim territory and get the most points. So in an abstract sense, the board is an overworld that you explore with your pieces to capture territory, right? Mm. Sounds familiar. Risk. <laughs> right? And what's really interesting, you, like you say risk, chess and go over time right. evolved into war games. Does risk count as an open world game? I think it would count as a overworld. So from the mechanics that you'll see here, it strictly doesn't count, right? But the overworld that you move around in, yeah, I, I would say so. I'd have to look, a lot of the mechanics we're talking about are specifically for video games, so there might be a little bit of different <laughs> criteria for board games, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's always different criteria for oh, yeah, games. Board games. Board games are way different. They're very different, but I, I, I would uh, reckon it is right. So, but that was a no very nice segue. Risk there because the chess and the go they evolved in the 19th century into war gaming, right? Like you said, in Risk, you take yeah. your armies, you move them around the map. This overworld map, this not to, it's typically not to scale, right? Yeah. And you are trying to defeat. To defeat the other armies and think about what Ron when Ron was on and we were talking about the female war gamers right yeah. right so war games they had actual practical use and that was the next evolution of using of the overworld and evolving it into a realistic map there and those overworld these war games they got a fantasy aesthetic. They got the yeah. D and D treatment with the. We game. like we like fantasy. Yeah, we like fantasy. Probably, stuff. probably a big chunk of that is from like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, all those are those are yeah. old books. Right. You don't realize it, right? but they're old. Oh, they are, and they we owe so much. Fantasy yeah. genre owes so much to those, and the game that specifically and at evolved war gaming it was called Chainmail in 1971 and that's what added this fantasy aesthetic right that's what drew off of Tolkien's lore yeah. the orcs and the elves right and evolved that and from there Dungeons and Dragons looked at that and was like let's do it yeah, let's do that but you <laughs> get to make everything let's do everything right so in Dungeons and Dragons released in 1974 and then later 1975 Empire of the Petal Throne, really. These role-playing games that make use of the overworld map, which uh, is- But one's definitely more popular. One is definitely more popular, right? Yeah. I had not even heard of Empire of the Petal Throne until yeah. doing this research, yeah. right? But it's cool that during the same period, people were taking these inspirations and how do we make a game out of it? Yeah, right? and D&D, and they also turned it into that. Yeah, they made a simplified D&D board game called Dungeon. It's a fantasy board game where you can have little mini Dungeons and Dragons adventures on, on an overworld map, right? Yeah. And so this, this over, as we evolve, right, the role-playing games looked at, uh, the role-playing video games looked at what D&D was doing, older games with the war games were doing, and started implementing those, those maps into their games, yeah. right? And so in the 1980s, they're like, let's pull in these overworld maps. And they weren't to scale yet, like in the modern games, but that's when you see those starting to be incorporated into games. Yeah. Do you know what year and what game the first electronic open world game is? Uh, 1970s Sega's Jet Rocket. Yes, yes. And you were super excited about this. Oh, game. yeah. Yes. That's just, it, the name just sounded cool. It sounds cool. And right? also, the, it, it's a projection thing. And I was like, is this on um, the Virtual Boy? Right. <laughs> kind of, and it feels like the Virtual Boy was inspired by this because I was looking at pictures of it. It's a big arcane machine where it has the goggles like the Virtual Boy, right? You stick your head in, you're, and you're flying a plane in an open world. It, and so, yeah, one's probably more popular than the other. Right. <laughs> but it, the first electronic example of 
an open world game where you're flying around, shooting targets, <laughs> seeing the landscape below you in an arcade setting. So yeah. later, we're like, let's let's bring these home. Let's just shrink them down into to consoles. So the first one, the first open world video game, was called Taito's Western Gun or Gunfight in North America. Right, and this game specifically, you're playing each player is playing as cowboys, <laughs> so the precursor to Red Dead Redemption, obviously. Right, and so you're playing as cowboys, and you're in the desert, and there's cactuses, and there are mountains, and all tumbleweeds, and you're just moving around this open world map trying to shoot each other. <laughs> it's like fun, it's it actually sounds like a pretty cool concept, especially how early. That what is it on? I think it was on the the Atari. I'd have to double check that. I should have wrote that in. Yeah, huh? yeah, you should have. Yeah, we will. We'll, we'll fact check that after this, okay. right? So we're finally getting in into consoles here. And so later, in 1984, it evolved again, right? Yeah. So the first fully scaled, on foot open world games were Courageous Perseus and highlight in 1984. I had never heard of those before. I know, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I looked them up though. I looked up highlight specifically. I'm like, what is that? Is that a chemical? <laughs> what is it, it sounds <laughs> like it. It, sound like a it sounds <laughs> right. And so I, I looked it yeah. up and it actually, it looks a lot like Zelda, right? The, the yeah. Legend of Zelda yeah. that came yeah. out in 19, 86 uh, you you're moving through panels on the screen as you move the screen moves with you and it's an open world scaled map but it's not fun <laughs> it's not very well made so Zelda's like that's a good idea let's do it better let's do it better because Nintendo's always copying people they are and they're putting their own spin making it great right yeah and thanks to that and it's so funny when we were starting the research for this before we when we were coming up with the idea, I was like, what do you think the first one is? And you said, Legend of Zelda, 1986. Yeah. And I was like, it might not be the first, but I think it's pretty important. It's, it's probably the most influential at this It point. probably is. In, in my it's, research, it's probably where it like took off. It is. It like, absolutely it was, like, is. And, and you were like, your, your intuition about that was correct, right? So in the research about this, I found that Legend of Zelda is by many considered the most influential open world game of all time. And any open world game after that draws inspiration directly from what Zelda set the framework as. Whoa, you, right on, you did it, yeah. you were right. Yeah. <laughs> Props to you. <laughs> And so the next big evolution, that's a pixel game, that's on the Super Nintendo. Yeah. Uh, it was limited by its time, but the next big leap forward in open world gaming was in 2001 when, with Grand Theft Auto 3. Ah, GTA. Right? GTA, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> GTA 1 and 2 were top down pixel shoot em up games. The same, similar gameplay, but it was GTA 3 that was like, let's move that 2D, let's make a fully scaled world. Oh geez, I think there's a game that's like the original 2 that came out. I, I, I don't Miami know what Hotline? you're talking about. Yes, Miami Hotline yeah, takes there it direct is. inspiration from the original But it's GTAs. a lot newer. <laughs> it's a lot newer, right? So it takes inspiration on that and evolves it. So, and now we're, we went through the, 300 BC, and now... Or 2001. 2001. It's 2001. And where are we at now in the timeline? And what a lot of game reporters consider the next evolution is actually Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. They did it again. Yeah. Zelda did it again. <laughs> Zelda's always doing it. So what, what Breath of the Wild did right, and the reason it's the next leap forward is because it introduced an innovative like, sandbox approach to the game, uh, where... There's, you have, as a Zelda player, you have a lot of control over the world. It's not a true sandbox in the way Minecraft is, but it was a huge step forward, it by many is considered a huge step forward in open world gaming. No. So here we are now. Yeah. <laughs> and with the new one coming out, I think it's going to influence You think again. it's going to do it again? <laughs> because from what we've seen, there's like three different maps. Really? Uh, okay. On top Three of layers. each other. Yeah. 
a underground section, the normal overworld, and then the Sky Islands. We're gonna have to come back and do an episode. Oh yeah. About the game, right? Oh yeah. See, see how much of what we're talking about here fits that role, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's the history. We did thousands of years of history, but what is an open world game? I think I think we better yeah. get into that. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so. I looked at a lot of sources, but the one that I really liked was called the Codex Gamicus, right? And Interesting name. It's pretty cool. They had and they listed off seven specific criteria for modern open world games. So we're going to go through those, and we're going to talk about them in terms of our favorite games. So you're going to talk about them in terms of Breath, Breath of the Wild. Wild. I'm going to talk about them in terms of Marvel Spider-Man, right? So Spider-Man PS4. Spider-Man PS5, because though that's one of my favorites. Yeah. Right? It's a it's a good game. Yeah, it's awesome. And so they said and the, there's not a lot of people have different definitions. I thought this was funny. There's like there's no consistent definition, but here's a good definition. <laughs> yeah. So let me read you that good definition that they provided, then we'll get into the def get into the criteria here. So the most common usage of the term open world is a game that features free roaming outdoor exploration across a large game world that is fully scaled and continuous. I thought that was a sweet definition. Yeah, yeah that's, that's Breath of the that's Wild for you. That's really good. And I, on that note, I think it's time to send the first sheet. Ooh. Okay, so we, ha we laid out the broad definition. Let's dive into the criteria here. And the very first criteria that we heard in the definition is a free roaming environment with limited restrictions on where the player can go and what they can yeah, do. Yeah, like there's, with Breath of the Wild, uh, you can go pretty much anywhere. You can climb on top of mountains. You can, uh, let's see, there's a ton of like crevasses mm. you can go into, but there is a like border of sorts sure. and if, that you cannot go past. It's basically a giant void except for in one corner okay <laughs> and what is the border is it like an invisible wall or is it like a natural barrier natural barrier yeah, and it's that's like the whole area is a raised plateau okay see that's see that's what a lot of open worlds make use of compared to linear games where linear games you'll have be on this track and there'll be an invisible wall and you can see the map over there and i want to go there open world's like no you can go there might not be worth it but you can go there yeah but again <laughs> in that one corner if you just go too far you get lost okay that's cool that's a cool way to make the border so do you get lost and then does it spit you back into bounds yeah okay see that's a really cool way to handle what is there making an a natural wall? border right it's either it's there's an invisible wall or it does that and because so i know it does that yeah. somewhere else and in the Lost Woods. I yeah, think. and a lot of these games will have invisible walls throughout, but they try to make use of more natural bears. So I'm thinking about Spider-Man, right? And Spider-Man, for those of you who don't know and who most everyone knows, right, it's set in New York, set in Queens, New York. And it's the game makes a scaled down version of New York. So the barrier that you have there is the is the water, yeah, right? Water. And because you're not, you can jump in the water, but like when you said you get lost in the woods, it'll spit you back out. If you jump in the water, it'll just spit you back into New York, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I was remembering like, what was the opening of Spider-Man? How long did it take me playing the game to actually be able to go swinging, right? The best part of Spider-Man, yeah. swinging through the city. And it took about three minutes. The, oh wow! Yeah, three minutes. You you take you you do the opening cutscene as Peter. You put on your suit. You jump out the window, and then it says, "Hit this button and start swinging." Yeah, it's like it's gets you in there. You look ever. You can go everywhere, and it's te it's telling you to go that way. But you know, I experimented with it. You can go wherever <laughs> you yeah. want, right? And with Breath of the Wild, there is a tutorial area that you're not able to get off until you complete it. But it's still a big area yeah absolutely and open world games often early in the game will have those limits to help players learn the game right like spider-man you have to open up these towers before you can reveal more of the map and a lot of yeah, open world that's, games will that's do with that. breath of the wild mm -hmm. yeah absolutely there's, ooh there's like 12 12 of them towers? yeah i didn't i, I should have looked that up i didn't count but it's like in spider-man you have to go 
hack it, hack in. There's a little hacking mini game, and then that reveals the map and what you can do. Yeah, in Breath <laughs> of the Wild, you just you have to climb up it for one, and you have to. There's this thing called the Shiga Slate. He that's ancient technology, but it's like an iPhone at this point. <laughs> he, it can take photos <laughs> and do all sorts of stuff. That's great. But <laughs> once you get to the top, there's this panel, and you hold it up to it, it will unlock the map for you. Oh, very cool. OK, so it's very similar mechanic, yeah. right? Where the, but once those are all revealed, you can go anywhere. Yeah. And it's like in Spider-Man, that's the main appeal is this free roaming mechanic. You crawl on walls, you run on walls, you swing through them, right? It's great. And I, you, what I do the very first time I play one of these is I see the tallest building, and I go and jump off of it. Cause it just feels like a rite of passage in Spider-Man games. So, Keep a faith. Yeah, leap of faith, exactly. Yeah. So that's the first criteria, free roaming in the environment. What is the next criteria that the game of kiss? <laughs> um, an out outdoor environment, mm. mm -hmm. um, which accounts for a majority of the game's environment versus indoor environments like a cave, dungeons, and buildings. Yeah, so you, this is, we're thinking like, Spider-Man, you're outside, you're in New York, and there are gonna be times when you go into buildings and have missions like that. There are gonna be times in Zelda, I'm assuming, where you go you into dungeons and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I mean, yeah, there are the dungeons, mm. but most other buildings you could just walk into, get, get what you need, mm. walk out. Yeah, exactly. And because of that, the ma vast majority of the gameplay takes place in a sprawling outdoor environment. Yeah. Right. I'm going to be walking on the streets. I'm going to be meeting people. I'm going to be swinging through, seeing the cars, all everything, right? Yeah. And there's sometimes when you go into the building to beat up a boss. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Like most the most. first the first boss. Oh, there you go. Uh, for, uh fist. Kingpin? Yes. It, Kingpin. It's same, same person. Same person. Same person. <laughs> it's two different but names and it's the, always confusing. Well, me. Like Kingpin's its villain name, right? And then yeah, but he Wilson was... Fisk's his government name. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Outdoor environment. Wait, Wait he's is... a government official? No, everyone has their government name oh. on their birth certificate. Oh, I think. Meant... Okay. Yeah, sorry, sir. Yeah, I my mean, brain's not working. Actually, in some stories, he became government official, which was really bad. Oh, so he became a double villain. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, we're derailing. Anyway. <laughs> so the next criteria bleeds into this one. Well, the past two. The past two. It's a large world, right? And it's at least the size of a large city, so New York, or an island. And that's opposed to like smaller environments, little buildings, dungeons, small towns. And so these games that you see, these open world games are going to be sprawling. They're going to be huge, right? You're, you're in Hyrule? Hyrule. Yeah, you're in Hyrule. Hyrule which I has mean. changed so many times yes. from game to game. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I'm talking about Spider-Man right now, but thinking about like the Elder Scroll games. Yeah. Each one of those games you know, takes place in a different region in this world. What is the continent called in, in Elder Scrolls? I don't That's know. That's a good question. Yeah. That is a good question. Yeah, anyway, each anyway. game. So Elder Scrolls Skyrim, you're playing in Skyrim. Morrowind, you're playing in Morrowind. Oblivion, Blit, so on and so forth. And Genshin Impact, you're playing in Tavak. There you go. Yeah, that's a good example, right? So the large world with a lot to explore, right? So that being said, what is the next criteria for the open world? Uh, going back to the other ones. A fully scaled world. Mm, mm -hmm. So everything, it's going to be consistent. Yeah. Right. You can use the characters as a unit of yeah, you measurement. Said, you said that during our pre-show. <laughs> is like, well, if we know that Link is, which we learned, 5'2", you yeah. can judge how big other characters this, are. This character is or how much four is that, Mario's tall. How much is that in centimeters? <laughs> I don't know. We should probably think about that yeah. stuff, right? <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. anyway, Again. this Link tall, or this Mario tall. Mario it's, might not be the greatest. Is Mario f fully scaled? All of them? He's different in every game. Yeah, that might not be the greatest. But as long as it's scaled in the current game, right? And in some games, he goes from this to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I like what you said of using your character as a unit of measurement. So Spidey, I think, is 
5'11", 170 pounds, the weight doesn't matter, <laughs> but the height yeah. does. So I can kind of immerse myself and know what it kind of feels like to be in New York. Yeah, and um, mm -hmm. Link is uh, shorter than I am, 5'2", <laughs> which shocked me. Yes. Because... I, yeah, I'm shocked by that. Because, like, <laughs> Zelda is, what was it, 5'10", 5'8", mm. something like that? Yeah, uh, I think you said 5'6". Okay. Right? So she's still relatively short. But she, taller than she Link. She looks huge compared to Link. <laughs> and so you, the scaling's going to be consistent. You know how big a car is by, by how much Spidey's standing next to it, right? Yeah. So that, that's and it's also, very important. And also, it's New York. Mm -hmm. You know what New York is like. Exactly. And you know what a city there, is like. You can, since it is scaled, you can kind of get a sense of what it is like to be there. Yeah, and if you've mm -hmm. been in the city... Yeah, I, I've never been to New York, but I've been to Chicago. So when I play, I'm like, oh, this does feel like a city. Yeah. That's cool, right? I can't I've tell you Chicago. I can't tell you the difference between Chicago and New York, but I can understand how it feels, yeah. right? And so after we're talking about the fully scaled world, the next criteria is on foot traversal. So mm. you can explore this whole world on foot, like a lot of games require you to move from zone to zone through a loading screen, yeah. through which Zelda definitely has a ton right. of. Right, and the loading screens might look different. It might be like a horse, <laughs> right? Yeah. It might be you on a boat or something like that. Spider-Man's is interesting. Yeah, Spider-Man is really sure. interesting, but the, yeah, it's called fast travel, which we did skip over, but we'll, we'll talk about the, I think this is a good point um, to talk about the difference right here, right? So. A lot of games require you to move that way, but open world games give you the option to fast travel from yes. point to point. And that's the difference here, is if you have the option to literally walk from one end of the map to the other, that's a core mechanic. Yes, Skyrim. Yes, Skyrim. Skyrim. On foot, you could, I did that the first time I played. It was like, how long will it take me to walk from here to There's here? There's a wagon <laughs> surface. Or Spidey, how long will it take me to swing from end to end, right? Or with me, like, f how fast can you go on your horse? Yeah, you get from, exactly. You get from uh, the Gerudo Desert to the Kala Ancient Tech mm. Lab. How long did that take? I've never done that. Those done are like okay. complete opposite ends of the map. <laughs> or thinking about Minecraft, you told me it took someone like 24 hours to get to the end of the map. Maybe longer. Maybe longer, because uh, it's that like expansive. That, uh, this was yeah. in an older version, yeah. which was actually smaller. Oh, really? Like so the Farland was a uh, shorter distance. Okay. And now it's... Now it's even, for, so maybe it'll take two days, 48 hours now. Several uh, weeks. Well, the last example we get, is I think they'll get the point that you can go anywhere on foot, right? On foot or whatever uh, or transportation device you're using. And in another What is the, the glider? Paraglider. The paraglider. paraglider. That's another mm -hmm. Breath of the Wild thing, but <laughs> I still can't believe this is in the game. In Breath of the Wild, there's a motorcycle. <laughs> Yeah, which is wild. You got motorcycles and cell phones. Okay, what time period is this? It's at? like <laughs> uh, medieval Europe. Okay. But all the there's a ton of tech from a more ancient group of people. I see. But it, it's a video game. We suspend yeah. our belief. We, yeah, there's also giant <laughs> robots walking around everywhere. Exactly. The technology exists. And the last example I'll get is in World of Warcraft. I, one of the first things I do is just walk top to bottom, figure out the pathing between the mountains, and I die a lot because that's good level that's, design. Wow. That's wow, each zone's wow. gonna have higher levels of NPCs, but I could still do it. I just have to do the death walk a lot. <laughs> so that's on foot traversal. So what's the next main criteria here? A real time world. Mm -hmm. So like, the world moves without you moving. Yes, yes, so it's, there's time, right? Yeah. There's a day and night cycle. The NPCs are living, they're existing yeah, on their um, own. In Breath of the Wild, uh, each NPC has like a set path that they take mm. each and every day. Yeah. Which is 
pretty funny. That is pretty cool. So you can know, like, if I need to see this NPC, what time of day it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, where uh, can I look? Where should in, I look uh, for? Same in uh, Stardew Valley. I almost forgot what it was called. Uh, so that being, yeah, sorry about that. I, yeah. um, yeah, in Stardew Valley, I know that's a main mechanic, yeah, right? and it's the day and night cycle. And uh, with their paths, again, they change depending on what day it is. Oh, really? And they change depending on what season it is. That's so cool. And they change if it's raining or not. Really? Yeah. That is very cool. It's a very good that game. That is a very good Have game. you played it? I haven't played it yet. <gasps> you should play it. Is it multiplayer? It is. We should play. Yes. That'd be so fun. Okay, let's Build a farm. Yes. Share let's discovery let's farm. <laughs> and what was I thinking? So in Spidey, yeah, in Spidey, yeah, Spidey, you can sit there, you can sit on a wall, and everything will keep happening. The cars will keep driving, the NPCs will keep walking around, living their lives, going in stores. I just remembered you can do the Spider-Man 3 thing. What's that? The emo Peter Parker dance oh, yeah. walking down can, the sidewalk. You can, yeah. I forgot <laughs> that that's in the game. You can, yes, absolutely. You, I Now I think I might have to do that. I haven't done it yet, <laughs> which is a fantastic little Easter egg that they put in there. Because, And for those of you that don't know, the 2007 Spider-Man game uh, movie that came out, there's a part where Peter, he kind of has like an emo phase, <laughs> and he goes yeah. down, he gets new clothes, all black clothes, and, and a black suit. He, and the black the, suit, the yeah, you're, you're the right, the black suit. Spidey suit, and then a actual suit to put over it, and he gets his hair flipped, and he does this really cringy dance. Yeah. It's hilarious. It's, it's a great meme, that, uh, and the memes are called Bully McGuire. If you, look those up if you want to get lost. I didn't know a, that's what they were called. Yeah, look those up if you want to get lost in a rabbit hole. <laughs> so that, the, the last criteria, those were the first six. The last criteria here for a mainstream open world game is a 3D environment. Yeah. 3D graphics. It's all I mean, rendered, real-time 3D, and the player I mean, can explore it in first person or third person. I mean, I guess this one doesn't have to be applied to every game. It like doesn't. the original Legend of Zelda. It doesn't have that. This isn't a requirement, unlike that's like, these other ones. This, that's why I say for modern. A lot. Of oh, yeah. Modern, right? So I think the mechanics that you see before here are, are more important, but modern ones are going to be 3D Terraria. graphics, right? Terraria. Th Terraria is 2.5D, so that even breaks the rules, it is? right? Yeah, so it's 2D because. And then it's 2.5 because you can interact with the background. Oh, yeah, place mm -hmm. walls behind. You yeah. can place walls behind. Yep. So. Yeah. So just to I recap. I barely played that game. Yeah. So. <laughs> just to recap here of the seven criteria, we have a free roaming environment. An outdoor environment. A large world. And a fully scaled world. On foot traversal. A real time world. And 3D graphics. Yeah. Yeah. That one we can take it or leave it. Yeah, you don't you don't have to have it, like some of the. Exactly, and Terraria is a great example of that. So, let's talk. We talked about our favorites. We talked about these games as our examples, but let's talk about some of the most popular. Yeah. Games. Let's just list some off, and then we'll uh, use those. Some. Yeah, well, I made a big list. Okay, some. go ahead. You read half. I'll read half. Breath of the Wild, GTA Five, Elder Scrolls Five. Skyrim, The Witcher 3, Red Dead 2, Fallout games, Elden Ring, Marvel Spider-Man, Genshin Impact. Okay, okay. My, my turn, we have Sea of Thieves, Assassin's Creed games, so the modern, more the modern ones, Middle Earth, Shadow of War, Shadow of the Colossus, Divinity, Original Sin 2, Subnautica, No Man's Sky, Forza 345, World of Warcraft and Minecraft. Minecraft. Okay. Okay. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> it's Minecraft. It's right? Minecraft. That's the it's, open world it's game. The, yeah, it's one of the most influential games ever. There's yes. so many. There's so many copies of it. Right. It, it's the best-selling <laughs> game of all time. Yeah. Right. But I thought I put Minecraft at the end of the list here because I think as I was doing this research, I think it's important to touch on. Sandbox. What is the term sandbox? It's a, it's a it's a kind of open world game. And 
what, was, what we see is that a lot of people use the word sandbox interchangeably with open world, but it has its own implications, its own definition. Mm. So they will often use it incorrectly when it doesn't necessarily, an open world game isn't necessarily a sandbox because a true sandbox game is where a player has the tools to modify the world that, yeah. and create how they play. Again, think mm -hmm. Minecraft. You've, mm -hmm. You can destroy anything, in, almost anything. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, you can destroy everything in the game. Exactly. So in a sandbox game, a true sandbox game, you're a god. Yeah. You control the experience. And I saw this in a YouTube comment, which was great. It was like a lot of open world games are you're the protagonist. In the sandbox games, you're the god. Yeah, you're a god. <laughs> and so... Which also translates to D&D. Which does translate translate to D&D, right? And so you were saying that D&D is a sandbox, and I agree with that. And because the sandbox, I would say, is also on a spectrum. You have more and less tools to change your experience based on the game. So think about the dungeon master or the game master. Yeah, the dungeon master is the god of is that the world. God. You create everything. You, you control can, the experience. You can uh, TPK. <laughs> Total part. Total party kill. Yes, there you go. <laughs> you can. And, you know, your players might not play with you again, but you controlled that experience because yeah. you, you're God. <laughs> yeah. But as a player, it's also a sandbox, just not to the degree as a DM is, right? Because you can still control your experience. You can interact with things in the environment. You can destroy tables. You can break down houses. You can do whatever creative thing you have, and, but you don't have the degree of control yeah. as as the DM. The DM is in the sandbox game, the, the players are in the open world game. Um, so just think about this, right? The open world refers to the lack of limits, right? The free roaming that we were talking about that the player has in exploring the world, whereas the sandboxes are based on giving the player the tools to create freedom within their experience. And with, so all of that to say, Open world games, a lot of them are sandboxes, but just because they're an open world doesn't mean it is a sandbox. Yeah. And a good example that we were talking about in pre-show with this was Skyrim. Yes. The base experience for Skyrim is purely an open world game. Right? It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's very, a lot of fun, right? Uh, but the, it's, you're playing the experience that the game developers are giving to you. Yeah. But once you give the player the ability to use mods, it becomes oh. a sandbox open Oh, did you game. hear about the first mod? No. What's that? So uh, it was like this really dumb one that added horse armor. Hmm. Like horse armor. It did nothing. Okay. It, did, it was purely cosmetic. Okay. But Bethesda charged you money to use it. Really? Yeah. What? Yeah. A mod. That defeats the purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. They, they swiftly undid it okay, once good. Out, outrage. Good, good. That's a good decision to undo. Yeah, like, <laughs> you shouldn't pay someone to be able to mod your game. Right. And I think, I don't know where or I was going with that, but have my favorite. Paid. Yeah, they should. Mod yeah. should be a tool for the community for free to update the, the game. Yeah. And to their experience, right? Unless you're hacking, don't no no hacking. <laughs> but I will say before we move on for this, um, Skyrim mods. My favorite mod was the Goku mod. <laughs> so it modded Goku in the Skyrim that you get to play as Goku, and they even made his abilities, right? The Kamehameha wave, the Key Blast, um, the Super Kamehameha. Saiyan. Yeah. Yep, yep. My my favorite is uh, this streamer Doug Doug. Mm. He he likes doing like. If I say this, then ten, 10 of this spawn. Okay. He did that in yeah. Skyrim. Sure. Um, one of the items was cheese. cheese. If he said cheese, like 50 cheese wheels oh spawned God. on top of him. How did? And another one was dragon. Oh. Uh-oh. And, and trolls. How do you not say dragons in Skyrim? That's a hard one. <laughs> I, can see, is, I can see you not saying cheese, but dragon's like the thing main is, thing. He had Skyrim. to respond to TTS. Okay. Uh, Texas. I see. Yes. Yeah. So Twitch is trying to trick him yeah. into saying those things. Yeah. I see. That's that's a fun challenge. I've seen Point Crow do that with Shrek. Yeah. Yeah. In Breath of the Wild, yeah, he actually Breath got the mod mm. from Doug Doug. Oh, very cool. Yeah. That's cool that they collab on that. Yeah. They're actually pretty good friends. Cool. And so, 
I do have a couple more things to say about Sandbox. Then we'll get into some of the common mechanics you'll see in open world games. So what I was seeing is to know if it's a Sandbox game, some common things to look for is, is the map procedurally generated? Huh. Right, think about Ferrari, think about Minecraft where you jump into the game and the game is generated as soon as you load in. Yeah, using or, a seed. Using a seed versus Spider-Man where the map is the same every time. Yeah. And Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's Stardew Valley. That's My the, brain can't yeah. think. Right <laughs> that's now. okay. And, and then the last thing I'll say is that you can often tell it's a sandbox game if your character is just a blank slate, if they're not important. <laughs> right? In yeah. Minecraft, you're just Steve, right? Steve or Alex. Steve or Alex. Those are the main base character. Two. And then you can customize mm -hmm. them. Uh, the wazoo. Yeah, in Terraria, you're just a you're just a character, and, and same with you get to shape the world, but you're Stardew. not you're not the chosen one. You're not the dragonborn like in Skyrim. <laughs> you're not you're not Link, right? Who, yeah. You're just some dude. You're just some dude. So keep that in mind. I just thought that was important yeah, to to talk about because people use those terms interchangeably. In Stardew Valley, you're the you just happen to be the son of this person, or the grandson of this person who just died, okay. and he left you his farm. There you go, right, you're just, you're just a person. You're like, let me embed myself into the story. So, we've talked about the core mechanics, right? The mechanics that have to be there for it to be an open world game, but now we're gonna talk about some of the common mechanics that exist across all open world games. The first one being collectibles. Oh. <laughs> uh, and breath. These are things that throughout the game, whether it's trophies, achievements, unlockables, just in-game items that don't do anything, but you know you did something special to get it. I think in Breath of the Wild, isn't there like a golden turd thing? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in Breath of the Wild, the main collectibles are the armors, the armor sets, the um, shrines, mm. all 120. Okay. Uh, not counting the ones headed in DLC, and the Korok seeds. Oh, wow. <laughs> there are 900, 900. Korok seeds around the map. <laughs> you have to do many little puzzles for them. Wow. And once you, and like, they're useful. You can trade them in at, with Hestu to get armor slots. Mm. So that's very useful. Yeah, but once you find all of them, you get, you, you get the stupidest trophy ever. It does nothing. It looks like a pile of poop. <laughs> but it's golden. No, it's not even that. Oh, wait. oh come on. <laughs> it's not golden. <laughs> oh, that's that's. It's funny. like tan. It doesn't do anything, does it's it? It's tan and brown. It's like, here Why does know. it exist? You did it. <laughs> that's funny. That's the developers messing with you. <laughs> yeah, it is. I hope they're not in the next you, one. You know they're they'll probably, mess, they're, you they'll, you know they'll mess with you somehow. There's probably going to be more. Probably going to be more. Three different maps. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh. So in Spider-Man, I'll talk about the collectibles there. You get backpacks that he leaves everywhere. You take pictures of landmarks. You get different suits, right? Uh, and then there's all kinds of achievements. Oh, there's also in Breath of the Wild, this is actually a main quest, it's the memories. Mm. Because you mm -hmm. play as Link after a 100 year, uh, 100 year slumber. Okay. Uh, after he gets defeated okay. in battle. And you wake up in the Shrine of Rev Resurrection, yada, yada, yada. Mm. It's Hyrule 100 years later. Oh, wow. You've forgotten pretty much everything. Yeah, truly. Am amnesia mechanic. Yes. <laughs> you barely know who you are. Okay. And as you play, you you get to uh, Kakariko Village, mm -hmm. and you talk to Impa, who gives you the main quest, defeat Ganon. Or, no, it's the Divine Beast quest. Mm, okay. You get defeat Ganon earlier, sure. I think. But you also get the Captured Memories quest, mm. which you have to go around to a certain spot. You get photos of where they are. Okay. But you don't know exactly where they are. Sure. You just so get like, like. You get a little hint. Like yeah. Go here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you, you get there, you interact with this glowing thing there, 
you unlock the memory. You that's really watch cool. like a little thing. Yeah, that's the memory. That's so cool. That's a cool way to do an amnesia mechanic. Yeah, add it as a collectible. There's even there's yeah. even one for each um, divine beast. Oh, very that, cool. That's not part of the captured memories one. Yeah. That that's separate, but it's still there. Sure, you can still watch them. So there's a lot to collect in Zelda in Breath of the Wild. <laughs> yeah, there's so many armor sets. All right, ready? Send it. So look for those, whatever game, open world game you're playing, a lot of them have collectibles. You just went far on that. Yeah. <laughs> so the next one is customization. And we, oh. we broke this into two, right? We broke this into character customization. It's what your character looks like. What armor are you wearing, right? Yeah. What color is your gear, right? Yeah. And to dye it, and then we, also have play style. Yes. So these are the two forms of customization that we see that you often have in these games. Yeah, in Breath of the Wild, you have all these weapons, all these armors. You can even dye the armors. That's cool. In the dye shop. Yeah. Which, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, in and Spidey, like, we have all these suits that we were collecting. Oh, yeah. And what's cool about the suit, if I'm remembering correctly, they all give you different stats. Yeah. Yeah, which is really cool. So and it's another with, reason to collect them. Same with a bunch of the armor mm -hmm. sets in Breath of the Wild. Sure, some of them, you don't unlock them until you upgrade them mm. at the fairy mm -hmm. fountains, but but still, like, one is kind of required, the Flame Breaker. Sure. Which allows you to go on Mount Death. Oh, okay, so that's required to beat the game. Yeah. Okay, cool. I mean... You could just make a ton of heat res or flame resistant food. Oh, but that's that's but too it's, much effort. It's e <laughs> I mean, you can buy three potions okay. at the base of the mountain. Sure. But still, it's easier to get the armor. I see. It, the potions are there to get you sure. where the armor is. So the main, so like the character customization is like, what is my dye my gear as right? I'm generally gonna you're generally gonna use the best gear, but you can make it look certain. Yeah. And then play style is like the type of weapons you're using. Yeah. In Spider-Man, the play styles they have three distinct ones. So you have your gadgets. You have actually three talent trees. You have gadgets that you can upgrade, and then you have web swinging. So how you're whipping the dudes around. Then you have just basic combat. Or, like acrobatic stuff so but look out for the customization you get. and like think about skyrim like we can't change what link looks like we can't change what peter looks like but in skyrim you create your, you character, create your character at the beginning <laughs> of the game after yeah oh, look you're awake oh, oh yeah the classic classic gaming line first line in a game right and so after customization another core mechanic you're going to see is difficulty scaling and i think this exists across a lot of genres but i thought this was cool here because uh, oh yeah, well, tell yeah. me about it. Yeah, the playstyle for customization for Breath of the Wild. Yeah, you, tell me. You, you cut me off before I could sorry, talk sorry, about sorry. it. <laughs> There's the, um, you could do sneaky, mm -hmm. which will, mm -hmm. you can sneak up on enemies yeah. and do a back strike, which okay. will be deal a eight times crit. Whoa. Yeah. Huge. And the funny <laughs> thing is, most pros have this down. If you back strike an enemy, when they stand back up, they immediately turn around to where you were. So if you walk in front of them before oh, they do cool. that, they, they turn around, wow. don't see you, and you can backstrike them again. again. Nice. <laughs> that's how that's awesome. most pros handle like the silver enemies. Okay. That reminds me, in Skyrim, there's a calming spell where you could use it on a, a hostile enemy and they'll chill. Oh, yeah, you just walk it behind them. It was, you couldn't use it on a dragon, but you could walk behind them, stab them, calm them, walk behind them, stab them. I did that cheese on my mobs it worked for. <laughs> yeah, and then the other one, stealth. Yeah, Spidey. Stealth. Yeah, Spidey actually does have a pretty good stealth mechanic. But what's stealth look like? And that was the stealth. That this was it? Stealth. That's stealth, okay. Stealth. So much I, stealth thing. I, <laughs> Uh, blowing everything up. Mm. There you go. It's very with, stealthy. With your bombs. Also, I think that's the opposite of stealth. Yeah, that's why it's <laughs> stealth. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Ready to move on to difficulty yes. stealth? Yes. Okay, sorry to cut you off. Let's go on to difficulty. And you brought this point up. So oh. 
What we were talking about in the pre-show is that there is difficulty scaling throughout your first playthrough, and then there's difficulty scaling on future playthroughs. Yes. Right? So on your current playthrough in Spider-Man, like the mobs are gonna get new weapons, they're gonna get better armor, they're gonna be bigger, there's gonna be more advanced types, the bosses are gonna make you use new mechanics, right? Yeah. And you were talking about how the first two, the bosses in Breath of the Wild, like they have health scaling. Yeah. And the first two, they have normal HP. Mm. If normal, what they're what they're originally having, like mm. 800 or something like that. But once you, but after that, the next two, the game sees that you beat these two. Okay. So they, I don't know, up double maybe the wow. health <laughs> of the next two. Yeah. Which is why you go. Why you go to the Gerudo Desert before? Okay. Because then you can get the e the most cheese strat in the game. Oh yeah. Urbosa's Fury. Okay. You you do like a charged attack, mm -hmm. and lightning strikes everywhere. Ooh. It stuns every enemy, including bosses. And bosses. <laughs> including bosses. Those bosses can't be stunned. That's that's super cheese. <laughs> Man, that's good. Yeah, it okay. is really good. And you get three of them and wow. it recharges. Okay. So you can stomach Ganon. What? But it also Dang. if you if you beat those three or the the four, when you get to Calamity Ganon, uh, the Divine Beast will attack him and you will lose half his health. Okay. So he only has like 8,000 rather than 16,000. Sure, that's, that's very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So it's definitely worth it's going worth for it, the yeah. Divine Beast. For sure. And if you don't, any of them that you don't attack. So back to our collectibles, it's worth doing those yeah. optional things. And any of them you don't go and do, uh, you actually have to fight the boss from that dungeon before you fight oh, Ganon. Oh, okay. Wow. So it's really worth it to do those earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the the game scales yeah. as you go. The bosses are going to get harder. Uh, but there's a mechanic across a lot of these open world games called New Game Plus. Master mode. mode. Master mode. Yeah, master mode. Where you beat the game one time through and then you can play it again on a harder difficulty. Mm -hmm. So look out for that if you're someone who likes replaying games, if you like challenges. Then the last mechanic that we have outlined here, common mechanic, quests and objectives. Yes. And then we have main quests and side quests, which I think we talked about, we touched on in the yeah. collectibles, right? A lot of the collectibles you will get from side quests. No. Well. <laughs> or I mean, the, side the captured, missions. Captured Memories mm -hmm. is a main quest. Is it? Okay. And actually, once you get the first one, you mm. get Link's old shirt. Oh, very which is cool. actually a really nice shirt. There you go. That's that awesome. That allows you to see exactly what HP your enemies are oh, at. Oh, that's awesome. That's, so like, ooh, that's like helpful. Usually, yeah. it's just like a bar, just a bar, but this one gives you the gives number. You number. Okay, I would get that early in the game. Yeah. <laughs> so these side quests, they might not be in your log, but it's just like side things you can do in the game. And... Oftentimes the games would be like main quest, side quest, um, in your log, in, in your quest log. So quest logs are often things in these in games a, in, as well. <laughs> in the Breath of the Wild one, there's the um, shrine quests, mm. which you do to unlock a shrine, like make it rise out of the ground. Yeah. Because most shrines, you can just walk up to it. Sure. Other ones, you have to like do a certain thing. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was- Do like a puzzle. Yeah, shoot it the glowing mm -hmm. statue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which you didn't even need to start the quest to do, so. Yeah. So you're gonna, you're gonna have like the main quests that progress the story, the side quests that are just fun, and sometimes give collectibles or give like a nice. That shirt was a main quest, so that gave you a nice thing. But keep an eye out for the main and um, side quests. And one of the, <laughs> one of the technical shrine quests is, you have to help a dragon out because oh, there's, cool. there's three dragons. Sure. There's three dragons. They're more like Chinese dragons okay. rather than. Skyrim dragon. Sure. Um, For an aesthetic. <laughs> and it's covered in malice, which is the thing that's corrupting all of Hyrule. Sure. And you have to shoot the eyes on it mm. to get rid of it. Okay. You have to do that four times, but once you hit it once, the dragon moves. Oh, that's cool. 
So you have to glide over there. Sure. Shoot it again once the eyes open up again. That's a fun, fun mission. It was a fun, yeah. it's a, it sounds it's a boss, it's a boss fight, boss but it's a fun it. boss that fight. super fun. And then you get to shoot the dragon to get one of its scales. Sure. Drop it in the water at the spring that's there, mm -hmm. and it unlocks the unlocks. That the sounds like shrine. a really fun mission. It's a, it's Hopefully, a, they include something like that. Oh yeah, the, I hope the springs are still yeah, going to be there. Totally. So, I think as we close here, it's important for us to touch on a little, few pros, few cons. We don't have much time to go deep into them, but I'll go through the pros. We'll touch on them a little, then I'll let you go through the cons. So the, the main pro that we had here was autonomy. There's no pressure gameplay. You can play how you want to with little limits, free roaming. You can do your side missions how you want to. You can do the main mission. Sometimes I'll stay on side missions for yeah. for hours, literally hours. Or sometimes in like Genshin Impact, you have to do them in order to get the right adventure rank mm -hmm. to progress. Absolutely. And then so after that, you have multiple play styles, which we've been talking about. Power fantasy feels really good being Spider-Man. Oh. Feels and really good being Link. It feels really good destroying <laughs> the Really good being the Dragonborn in Skyrim, right? Uh, the so Guardians are such a pain. Yeah, it's yeah. immersive. You can get lost in the world, and they're super fun to explore. What about the cons? What are some of the cons that we um, have for open world games? Sometimes the narrative can be lost. Like, like you said, mm. you sometimes get stuck on side quests. Yep. You go back to the main quest. What was I doing? Yeah. Where was I? What I, I wouldn't say that for like Breath of the Wild because mm -hmm. it's all really memorable. It's really there's I a can, reason it's one of the best games. Yeah, I can remember a ton of it. Yes, absolutely. But it's just like if they make the game too ex too expansive, story can get lost, and it can also get overwhelming. It can get overwhelming. Yeah. Yes, decision paralysis. What does Point Crow say? <laughs> uh, collector's anxiety. Do you ever get collector's anxiety? Hey guys, Point Crow here. Do you ever get collector's anxiety? Some, Wish people, we could play that. some people don't like that much choice. It's overwhelming to them. I have to do everything. I have a friend like that who's like, I, I can't play those the, games. There's too much to do. Achievers. The achievers. Well, I, the achievers might like that, but I don't know, right? Like, that's a balance, it, the, yeah. if the achievers like it or not. It is just, I guess it depends on your mentality of how you yeah. achieve, right? Yeah. And so that can be too much to do. And the next one I have, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. How have you doing? Worlds can feel empty and unlived mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Which, there are towns all over Breath mm -hmm. of the Wild, so I, again, I wouldn't say that for this. Sure. You encounter travelers on the main roads. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't say that for Spider-Man either, but an example of this is Dynasty Warriors 8. They made it an open world game for the very first time, and the way they did that is just made wasteland. It was nothing. There was nothing there. So, so. it's Fallout. Well, it's Fallout if it was accurate. Yeah. <laughs> so, and last con we have here is large worlds can lead to many bugs many bugs many glitches in the game the thing is some glitches can help <laughs> like the freaking yes. blue torch missions yes. oh i hate those yes. <laughs> i hate those but there's no way to item smuggle so it makes it, makes it tricks better. the game mm -hmm. into thinking you you're not advantage of the glitches yeah. but sometimes if they're too big it can break the game and make it unfun another like example of that is fallout 76, right? That was notoriously broke. No Man's Sky, notoriously broken when it came out. Um, so that leads us into the Pokemon <laughs> Scarlet and Violet, notoriously broken. So as we conclude here, we just want to give you some good recommendations for starter games. So we have Minecraft. Obviously. Uh, that's a, a good, that's good, good cheap one. Game. There's a on lot of phone. people that love the game. It's on all of the platforms. Yeah. Breath of the Wild, Spider-Man, the two we've been talking about all episode. Fallout series. I think the Fallout series is really good. It's very immersive. And Skyrim. And Skyrim. Skyrim is a very good introductory fantasy game. Oh, yeah. So that wraps it up. Do you have anything else you want to touch on here mm -hmm. right at the end? The outro question? Oh, sure. We don't have yeah. too much time, but tell me what you learned here that you didn't know before the show. Uh, Rocket Man. Rocket, Rocket Man. <laughs> well, or Jet Rocket. Jet Rocket. Uh, okay. yes. Not Rocket All Man. of the history is what I learned <laughs> that I didn't know. Where, where did I get Rocket Man? Anyway. I wonder where you got that. Anyway. Anyway, thanks. Thanks for joining us. 
on this open world episode, guys. We want to give a big shout out to BCTV for letting us put this production on. Thanks for joining me, Xander. This yeah. was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, this, this was, was fun. Great. This I, I guess we'll episode. talk about one of my favorite games. Yes, so. absolutely. So we're really looking forward to doing more of these genres. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you want to talk, us to talk about a specific genre, email us at shareddiscoveryshow at gmail.com. You need to yell at Ron to get the Twitter up. <laughs> we do need to yell Still. at Ron to get the Twitter up. So as we close here, thanks for joining us on episode seven of Shared Discovery. Please make sure to have some fun, be kind to others, and play some games. What Be you good people. Say? There we go. Thanks for joining us, guys. <laughs>